Did you know that following the newest Ashlands update, there are now 18 possible raid events in Valheim, each adding a bit of chaos to your playthrough in their own special ways? I've already covered the early and mid game raids, but in this video we'll be covering the seven late game raids introduced in the Mistlands, Hilda's Request, and newest Ashlands update. And just like my last raid video, we'll be going into great detail about how each of them are triggered, how to prepare for them with some of the new base defenses, and how, if at all, these new raids can be deactivated. But don't worry, we'll also be recapping through some of the basics about how raids work, and how these events can be altered using the world modifier options. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more Valheim videos, and let's get into it. Raids in Valheim are random events, in which waves of hostile mobs are sent to attack you, mostly when you're at your base. As I mentioned in the intro, there are now a total of 18 different raid events in the game, and all of these raids can be split up into two main categories, army raids and non-army raids. Army raids are sent by the next Forsaken boss you're set to take on. They will be made up of creatures from the biome that the Forsaken boss rules over, and army raids are only deactivated once you vanquish the boss ending them. Non-army raids are also activated through world progression, defeating bosses, or in the case of the Hilda's Request raids, by completing quests. But unlike army raids, they cannot be deactivated once you've activated them. By default, these raid events can occur every 46 minutes your character is in Valheim. However, this frequency can now be altered using the world modifier settings making raids as regular as every 13 minutes, or even allowing you to turn them off completely if you want. When a raid has begun, a message will appear on screen. These messages are often unique to a specific raid, so it's definitely worth trying to remember which one lines up with which raid. At the beginning of each of these events, hostile creatures will spawn between 40 and 80 meters of the player. Each raid event will have its own unique suite of enemies for you to take on, and these creatures will all spawn in hunt mode, which means they will know the player's location within 200 meters. Lucky for you, these hostiles are unlikely to spawn within the area of your base, as certain items, known as base structures, will prevent creatures from spawning within 20 meters of them. But more on those in a bit. Throughout a raid, additional mobs will spawn in, or attempt to spawn in, at specific intervals, again, between 40 and 80 meters of the player. This spawning interval varies from creature to creature, but can be as fast as 2 seconds, or as long as 40 seconds. So, for example, every 40 seconds after a Yarl spawns in during its raid, another Yarl can spawn in. That is, as long as the spawn limit of this mob has not already been reached. These spawn limits also vary from creature to creature, ranging from one individual in the case of the Jarl, to up to 20. The game will only continue to spawn in mobs if the number of individuals active in the raid is less than the mob's spawn limit. So, generally speaking, killing more mobs during a raid will cause more to keep spawning in over the raid's duration, while skirting around the mobs and waiting until the raid is over to kill them will result in you having to deal with less enemies overall. But in addition to these respawn mechanics, the mobs in some raids can spawn back even faster than their predetermined spawning interval, with this rate depending on how much your character is moving around. And this becomes a lot more evident with some of the later game raids we'll be talking about, but I'll explain more about that later on. Each raid event will last a specified duration, some only last 80 seconds, while others can last up to 150 seconds. But in order for this timer to tick down, you or another player in that world must be inside the active raid area, which is the red circle shown on your minimap. Being outside this area will pause the timer, but as soon as you or another player re-enters the area, the timer will resume. Once the raid is over, the spawn creatures will begin to run away, and once they've de-aggroed, they should despawn. Using standard vanilla settings, there is a 20% chance of an active raid event occurring every 46 minutes, which is about one and a half full in-game day-night cycles. If a raid is triggered, one of the raid events in your active pool will be randomly selected. But depending on where you are in the game progression-wise, and other factors like where your character is in the world, your pool of active raid events will drastically differ. 
Most of the time when you're just out and about exploring or resource gathering, your active raid pool will likely be empty. Your active raid pool is often dependent on three factors. The first of these factors is game progression. As you progress through the game and defeat more bosses, certain raid events will become activated and deactivated. By default, this progression is based on which bosses have been defeated in the world you're in. And no, you can't avoid this progression by not hanging up the boss trophy. As soon as a new boss has been killed, your world will have progressed. However, going back to the world modifier settings again, you can instead change this to make your raids based on the progression of your character, rather than that of the world. This is particularly useful if you're playing on a multiplayer server, where different players might be at very different stages of the game, and prevents fresh characters from being caught out by much higher level raids. When this setting is applied, the game will determine a character's progression level based on whether they've picked up specific items linked to progression, such as a boss trophy, boss drop, Hilda quest items, or if they've obtained a forsaken power at the sacrificial stones. So, if you're playing a new character on a multiplayer server with this setting, I wouldn't recommend immediately activating all of the Forsaken powers available to you, as soon as you drop into the game. The second factor is where your character is when a raid is triggered. This includes both which biome you're in, and also whether you're near your base. All of the late game raid events will only become active if you're within 40 meters of at least three base structures. In fact, out of all of the possible 18 raids, the Wolf Raid is the only raid that can be activated when away from base structures. There are currently 32 eligible base structures in the game, including things like the campfire, workbench, portal, and bed. So even if you're being rather nomadic, having just a few of these items may enable a number of different raid events. When deciding the location of your main base, you might want to consider which raid events you'll have to face in it. The Black Forest and Plains biomes are very popular locations for main bases, but also have the highest number of possible raid events, including most of the late game army raids. The last factor only applies to a handful of the non-army raids, which can only be activated by completing a specific task, or defeating a specific mob in that world. The Troll Raid can only become activated after you've killed a troll out in the wild. And the same goes for the Sertling and Bat Raids, but instead with Sertlings and Bats. As I mentioned in my previous raid video, you don't even have to be the cause of their deaths. And Sertlings seem to have a fatal affinity for water. The three new Hilda Raids are activated when you fulfill each of Hilda's three quests. To give a quick recap, Hilda's request involves helping Haldor's sister, the Dwarf Merchant Hilda recovered three stolen chests. These chests, brass, silver, and bronze, are each obtained by defeating the mini-bosses Brenner, Gearhafer, and Zillenthunger. While defeating these mini-bosses doesn't activate the raids, as soon as you return one of the chests to Hilda, a new raid will be added to your active pool. But it's not all bad news. You'll also unlock a range of new clothing options. Wait, to buy? All of that and no freebies. <laughs> if you're feeling a bit concerned about these new raids, you should be. But there are many ways to defend your beautiful base. From trenches, to high walls, to wooden stakes. And with the newest upgrades to the game, there are now even more defensive methods that you might want to consider. The newer dwarven varieties of stake walls and sharp stakes are quite a significant upgrade from the originals but are sure to put a dent in any Viking's iron reserves. In comparison, the Ashwood stake wall, which are essentially sharp stakes but hung vertically, are slightly less durable than the Dwarven sharp stakes, but deal far more pierce damage, and are fairly cheap, requiring only six Ashwood to build, which is pretty easy to get your hands on once you eventually make it to the Ashlands. The Mistlands update also introduced ballistas, made from 10 black metal, 10 Yggdrasil wood, and 3 mechanical springs. These structures can act as an automated form of defense, holding up to 40 missiles, which can be crafted at the artisan table. Just make sure you're careful when loading the missiles, because as soon as the ballista is loaded, it will start looking for targets. And those targets can include you and your precious pets. You can override this by using a trophy on the ballista, 
making the ballista only target mobs that match that specific trophy. But note that only one trophy can be active on the ballista at once. Reusing the trophy on the ballista will reset it back to its default of targeting everything, which is personally how I prefer to keep the ballista. Just make sure you place it somewhere you'll be able to avoid its firing arc. Finally, also introduced with the Miscellans update, are the traps, made from 5 black metal, 10 bronze nails and 1 mechanical spring. Once you've got all your materials ready, place it somewhere you think might be somewhat strategic. Load it and wait. If anything gets too close, the trap will be triggered, inflicting a heck of a lot of damage and immobilizing the unsuspecting intruder for 5 seconds. After a few seconds, you can rearm the trap, ready for its next victim. You'll also notice that the trap takes damage every time it's triggered, so if you aren't fixing it regularly, the trap will break after 10 uses. However, once it does break, you'll get all of the materials back, so are free to quickly rebuild it. Now, hopefully you and your base are ready, we'll be going through each of the 7 raid events introduced in the Mislands, Ashlands and Hilda's request updates, starting with the 4 new army raids. As none of these new raids can become activated in the meadows, we're going to have to set up a couple of new bases in some of the other biomes. The boss of the Mislands, the Queen, is the first boss in the game with two possible army raids, and both of these raids will become activated when you defeat the boss of the plains, Yaglif. The first of these two army raids lasts for 90 seconds and is only active in the Mislands when you're near three or more base items. And thank Odin for that, because the Queen will send one Jarl and four ticks to your base. To make this even worse, the tick can appear in the one and two star variety, which can make them pretty lethal if they manage to get to you. Thankfully, these ticks won't be able to do much damage to your walls or structures and are pretty squishy so a few defensive spikes will go a long way. The Jarl, on the other hand, can prove to be a bit of a base destroyer, so make sure you're building with something strong, like black marble, if you're crazy enough to build your base in the Mistlands at all, that is. The Jarl are strong, but have a weak spot on their underbelly, so grab a bow and aim for that area. You may also want to consider having some fire barley wine handy, as this will drastically reduce the damage you take from the Jarl's fire attacks. The second of the Queen's army raids is the Seeker army raid, which lasts for 90 seconds and can only occur in the Black Forest, Plains, Mislands, Ashlands and Deep North, when you're near three or more base items. This time the Queen will send three Seeker and eight Seeker broods your way. Luckily, these mobs have quite a long respawn rate, so you won't have to worry too much about waves. But of course, watch out, as Seeker move fast and can fly. Both of these two raids will become deactivated when you defeat the boss of the Mistlands, the Queen. But this action will in turn activate another two new and terrifying army raids you'll have to look out for. The first of these two raids is the Undead Army Marches, in which the boss of the Ashlands, Varda, will send three charred Twitcher, three charred Marksmen, and two charred Warriors to attack you. This event will last 90 seconds and can only occur when you're near three or more base items within the Black Forest, Plains, Mistlands, Ashlands or Deep North. This raid can be pretty tough, particularly if you haven't upgraded yet to the Ashland tier weapons and armor, so Bone Mass's power will come in clutch to withstand those mighty attacks. Varda's second army raid is the Dead Have Been Summoned, which works a bit differently to other raid events in Valheim. Like the previous Farda army raid, this event lasts for 90 seconds and can only occur when you're near three or more base items within the Black Forest, Plains, Mistlands, Ashlands or Deep North. Farda will send up to three charred twitches along with up to three Monuments of Torment. These monuments can spawn between 50 and 75 meters of the player, but only monuments within the active area within 64 meters of the player will begin to spawn mobs. Monuments of Torment within the active area will spawn either a Charred Twitcher or Charred Warrior every 12 seconds, unless there are already three or more Charred enemies within 16 meters of the monument. In order to get rid of these monuments and stop them spawning in more Charred mobs to your base, you're going to have to destroy them, as they won't despawn by themselves after the raid ends. The monuments are resistant or immune to all forms of damage, but a few whacks of your sword or axe should do the job too. 
just make sure to look out for those warriors. During the raid, extra Monuments of Torment can spawn in, up to their spawn limit of 3. The spawn interval of these monuments is 1 minute, but as I alluded to earlier in this video, there are also other mechanics at play in this raid. If the player who triggered the raid is moving around a lot between destroying mobs and monuments, the Monuments of Torment will spawn in at a much faster rate, sometimes as quickly as within 10 seconds. Once you've killed the boss of the Ashlands, Varda, both of these two raids will be deactivated, and you can finally rest easy from army raids again, at least until the Deep North update. Lastly, we're going to be talking about the three raids that can be activated through the Hilda's Request side quests. These three raids are all non-army raids, meaning once you activate them, you won't be able to deactivate them. And to make things even worse, there is no escape from these raids, as each of them can be triggered in any biome. These three raids also most clearly demonstrate the additional respawn mechanics I mentioned earlier in the video. If you're running around a lot between killing mobs, they will respawn as quickly as within 10 seconds, but if you keep calm and try and fight on the spot, or with minimal movement, only the lower tier mobs will respawn, after about 20 seconds, and the higher tier mobs, including the mini bosses themselves, won't respawn at all. So something to consider if you're struggling with some of these more difficult events. Bringing Hilda back the brass chest from Brenner will activate the raid event She's Hot On Your Tail, in which Brenner will seek revenge on you, along with four skeletons and one rancid remains, which will both either be in one or two star forms. This raid lasts for 90 seconds, and can only occur when you're near three or more base items. Brenner has a fair amount of HP, and does a pretty damaging AoE attack, so don't underestimate her. As all of these guys are weak to blunt damage, a mason shield or two-handed club will make short work of these lot. Retrieving the silver chest from Gearhaffer and handing it back to Hilda will add the You Get the Chills event to your raid pool. Here, you'll be facing both fire and ice, as Gearhaffer will return with three Fenring and one Cultist, which will also be both either one star or two star. Again, this raid lasts for 90 seconds, and can only occur when you're near three or more base items. Gearhaffer has over three times the HP of Brenner, so prepare for a pretty hard fight. Luckily, both Gearhaffer and the Fenring are weak to fire attacks, but be aware that the Cultist will be immune to this damage type. The drops for all of these raids are pretty mediocre, with the mini-bosses only dropping their trophies but at least the cultist will drop between 1 and 2 red jute, helping you get your base ready for upcoming Yuletide festivities. Defeating Zill and Thunger in the Sealed Tower and returning the bronze chest to Hilda will add the They Were Bros event to your raid pool. This raid will last for 90 seconds and can only occur when you're near 3 or more base items. In this event, Zill and Thunger will return for some revenge, along with 4 fueling and 1 fueling berserker, Zill and Thunger are pretty strong, and have no weaknesses, and just as you fought them in the Seal Tower, you'll have to take out Thunger first and then Zill. Both can do serious damage to your wall defences, so make sure both you and your base are ready. Details for all 18 of Valheim's raids are available in this handy little PDF I made for Patreon, and I hope to add more supplements like this over there in the future. Right, so now you're all caught up with the newer raids, maybe you'd like to learn about Valheim's lore, and what it tells us about the game's ending. Thanks to all of you for watching, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.